Well, South Milford Church of Christ family, clearly these are unusual days. As many of you are aware, we're going to be continuing to gather each Sunday like this, worshiping together digitally until we can come together again in person. And so I know that for many of you, things seem really upside down right now, and recent events have really challenged, if you're like me, have challenged what we know or what we thought was certain. And so I want to encourage you to take heart this morning. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39 are a reminder. The Apostle Paul says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. And how fitting is that right now? Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so I just want to encourage you this morning as you gather together, hang on to those promises from the scriptures. Don't, don't give in to discouragement. We love all of you. We continue to pray for you. Please reach out with any needs that you have whatsoever. We, we can't help if we don't know of those needs. So don't hesitate to let us know if you just need someone to listen or if you need someone to pray with you or if you have a physical need, whatever it might be, let us know. I do want to take care of a few announcements this morning, again, re re regarding stream schedule. We're going to continue to stream our services until restrictions have been lifted. And, and Lord willing, we'll be meeting together sooner than later, but we are entrusting these things into the Lord's hands. So we're going to continue to stream to Facebook and YouTube. As you know, many churches have experienced issues with Facebook blocking their streams. So we've, we've paid our copyright licensing and all of those good things, but we still may experience some issues. So don't hesitate to go to YouTube to find the stream and uh, just uh, search South Mill for Church of Christ. Regarding online giving, you can still send a tithe check in the mail. You can still set up an auto draft. You just contact the office and we'll take care of that for you. And we're working on setting up an online giving platform that we'll have hopefully up soon, similar to like an Apple Pay. But the reason I share this isn't because, we, um, isn't because we're struggling, but because I've had multiple families asking. And so I want to reiterate to you that God has provided and I am confident that he will continue to provide for the finances of our church as we continue to reach out to missions and, and different uh, ministries. We're doing fine, and he's blessed us actually above and beyond measure. So we're excited, and we're, we're just excited to see how he continues to give us opportunities to be generous with what he's given us, with our missions, with the community, as people and ministries struggle in the midst of the financial climate that we're in. And so I know that God has blessed us so that we can give um, in a generous manner as well. Um, finally, regarding our needs thread, don't forget about that. It's on Facebook. It's pinned to the top of our page. So if you have a basic need, something that you could post, go ahead and do it. If you're on Facebook and you can meet that need in any way, jump in and help. If there's a need that you have that you don't want to broadcast, please contact me or Deb, an elder, a deacon, call the church office. We just want to reiterate that we're here to help. So all of that this morning I want to just invite you, uh, everyone where you're at, to join me, uh, wherever you're tuned in, to join me in corporate prayer. So would you begin this morning, wherever you're at, um, alone with your family or with your friends or whatever it might be, I want to give you two different things this morning to be praying about. First off, we know that we continue to give thanks to the Lord. I want you to think about all of the different things that he's done in your life, how he continues to care for you and provide for you. I think about these stones from the first week that, that represent uh, similar to what Israel was encouraged to do by God. Anytime that God was moving and doing amazing things, he said, I want you to set up this memorial. And so when they crossed over the Jordan, they piled up stones so that later on they could tell their kids about the power and provision and uh, promises of the God that they serve. And so similarly with us, the word of God is a reminder of God's power and provision and his promises. And we can give thanks to God for those things. So the first thing I want you to pray about is just give God the thanks this morning for how he continues to take care of you. The second thing I would encourage you to do is I know that there's a lot of fear. I know there's a lot of unknown, a lot of anxiety. So just submit to God all of your cares, all of your worries, all of your fears, and trust those things to him yourself, your livelihood, your loved ones, would you entrust them 
and yourself into his care. Declare that you trust him and ask that he would increase your faith in this time. So I'm going to give you a few minutes as a family just to pray together now. Strangers and neighbors, our blood is one. Children, generations, of every nation of kingdom come. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your hand. In the midst of uncertainty and fear, I, I want to show you this morning that we have a special role, one that God will make us sufficient for in these upside down times, because it's in times like this that the gospel can shine more brightly than ever before. And so much of what I want to share with you today, it's, it's not unique to me. I've had the privilege and ample time to read the past several weeks. I've been blessed by the outpouring of different things that our brothers and sisters all over the world have been writing and sharing. And so I felt inclined to share with you a modified message 
written by J.D. Greer this morning um, with, with some of my own spin on it, so to speak. But I want to begin today by reading from Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 8. And, and here Jesus talks about crises like this one that we're in, and, and he characterizes that as he says, those things will characterize the last days. It says this, later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when all this will happen. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They'll deceive many, and you will hear of of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. We talk about these last days. We've been in the last days since Jesus ascended. And and I want you to just hear me right up front. I want to be really clear. I'm not saying that this is some kind of divine sign that that Jesus' return is is right at the doorstep and that we should go huddle up and, and just kind of wait on the mountaintop for him to come. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day when Jesus will return. He even told his disciples that that wasn't for them to know the times and the seasons, nor the hour or the day of his return. What Jesus indicates here and what we need to understand and what's, what's needed to be in, in a Christian's understanding since Jesus ascended to heaven and promised his return, that God uses times like this, things like this, to wake up the world to the fragility of life and the reality of, of Jesus' return and divine judgment. It's, it's times like this, and there have been many There will be many that we have a tendency to have our foundations rocked out from underneath us. These are like birth pains, Jesus said. So birth pains, they really don't tell you the exact moment. I remember when Lisa and I went to um, the birthing classes before Luke was born, and I remember that there was a girl that was having contractions in that class, or and, and I thought, why aren't they rushing this girl off to the hospital so that she can have this baby? And they're like, oh, it, it could be weeks yet. And I didn't get it. I didn't get that those that, that didn't mean it was right time for, for the baby to be born. But birth, birth pains can't tell you the exact moment of new birth. But they do indicate that a time is drawing near. Uh, the time is getting shorter. A new reality is coming. And so his return draws near. It's, it's near every day that we breathe on this earth, every new day that he gives us to live. And so we can expect things like this to increase. And so we're, we're wise to hear these things as a divine um, warning from a good father who's saying to the people on earth, the world that we live in is very temporary. All of our foundations, apart from Jesus Christ, they are faulty foundations. And so I'm going to be really honest with you. It, this whole thing has been really humbling to me. When I first heard of COVID-19, I thought this would go into the category of near misses. I've grown accustomed to that. I'm sure that you have as well. You hear about an asteroid that comes close to Earth, and it, it just misses, and, and, and life goes on. And you hear about epidemics in other countries, and you think, you know, our medical system, you know, they'll always keep us safe. You hear of natural disasters in other places that don't directly affect you, but I think of how something that we can't even see, something that that a month ago not many of us were worried about that's just brought our nation to a screeching halt. I I like to be an optimist and believe that these things won't end up being as bad as some of the worst-case scenario predictions, but it's, it's shocking to me how quickly and easily our whole nation is shut down. It shows us just how fragile we are, how fragile life is. Many say regardless of what happens with the medical care that re- regarding this virus, that the economic implications of the shutdown are going to be staggering. And so we've got a job ahead of us, church. In, in all of these things, though, throughout Scripture, we see that first off this morning, God repeatedly will use things like this to wake people up and to shake our foundations. I think about a few people from the Scriptures. I think about Jacob. God brought him to his knees through a desperate fear for personal safety. I think about Moses. He found God through the loss of his career, the breakup of his family as he had experienced it in Egypt, being driven out from the place where he grew up into the wilderness. For the mighty Syrian general Naaman, it was a health scare, being diagnosed with leprosy that brought him to his knees. I even think about that mighty king uh, of, of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, who 
basically was, was shaken by the loss of his job and his sanity for, for a time. But in all of these cases, we have people falling flat on their backs, and from that position, they're finally in their life looking in the right direction. I think in, in times like this, God is saying, wake up. I want you to realize how fragile life is, how helpless you will be if you stand unprepared before the coming of the Lord. And so I want to ask this today, what happens What happens when our foundations are shaken to the core? What, what do we turn to? Where do we go to tell ourselves, you know, it's going to be okay, everything's going to be all right? Do you turn to your family? Do you turn to your health? Do you turn to a country with great prosperity, uh, state-of-the-art medical care? Do you turn to a strong national defense? And although these, these things aren't bad, they're, they're faulty foundations. Everything outside of Jesus Christ in this world is sinking sand. We know that from the scriptures. Only by reflecting on how fragile our lives are will we develop the right perspective on life. And so God can use these times. I know that he has already done so with my family. And so we count our days, like Moses said, so that we can make the best of our days. So we count our days so that we can make the days that we do have count. The second thing that, that Jesus tells us to do in this passage is to avoid false hopes. If you were listening when I read that, because there will be many false hopes offered or false prophets. Matthew 24, 11, it says, and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. And so hear me saying this, I, I'm not calling Democrats or Republicans false prophets. So, but Democrats are going to say, you know, if we were in charge, it would be better. Republicans are going to say the opposite. After this is done, we'll, we're going to revisit medical systems. We're going to develop vaccines. We're going to review protocols for early containment. Businesses are going to resolve to save more money, uh, to put more of their business online. And most of these things are probably going to be appropriate but ultimately, all of these earthly solutions are going to fail. In the final analysis, all of these things are going to be sinking sand. Nothing can deliver us from the sentence of death we're all ultimately under, save Jesus. The scripture tells us that through one man, through Adam, we all fell under the curse of death. But through one man, Jesus, who was and is God, we have been brought from death to life. I hope that it, wherever you're at today, that there's an amen for that. I think a Jonathan Edwards said, unconverted men, I, I want you to hear this, unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotting covering. And there are innumerable places where this covering is so weak that it won't bear their weight, and, and, and they can't even see those places. And so it's foolish for us to live our lives as if death isn't certain, and, and as if death God isn't going to come if there's not going to be a final judgment. Matthew 24, verse 13, Jesus says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures is the one who sets their hope in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message and keeps their hope there regardless of what is happening. Remember, Jesus told us a story. He taught well with stories in Matthew 7. 24, he talks about two builders, right? Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, Jesus said, like a person who builds their house on a solid rock, on good foundation. And though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise, I, I want you to recognize that just because this guy built his house on a good foundation doesn't mean the torrents and the flood waters and the winds aren't beating against him. And so though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is, is foolish, like a person who builds their house on the sand. And, and when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it's going to collapse with a mighty crash. And so again, I, I would ask you today, where is your foundation? I, I want us to stop for a moment here and proclaim and worship God for, for the solid, for proclaim who he is for the solid foundation that he's given us in Jesus Christ. For many of you, as we prepare to worship in a moment here, this is going to be a time of rejoicing. Do you have a foundation that's better than anything else that life could give you and that death can't take away? And, and that's so important right now as we walk literally through the valley of the shadow of death. For others of you today, it could be a time to make a new declaration, to come repentant before the Lord, that from this point forward, we're going to make our, our foundations, we're going to build our foundations upon you, Jesus. 
So if you would, let's, let's sing together about that foundation that we have in Jesus Christ. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. Live for you. Before we close today, church, I want you to see in this text a divine opportunity. I want to say that again, opportunity that God has given us. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, 
and the good news, that's the gospel, about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So on the heels of disastrous events, in the midst of crisis and difficulty, I want us to understand that the gospel has unprecedented opportunity. When God has done the work of shaking foundations, many are ready to look to him. So we have to use this opportunity to point people to Jesus Christ. And so I want to give you just a few practical things to take home with you, although you're already at home. So just to have at home with you a few practical things today. Number one, heed wise counsel. This isn't a time, I, I want us to, to not be mistaken, it's not a time for carelessness and it's not a time for panic. We all have natural biases. I do, you do. Some of us gravitate toward worst case scenario, doomsday prophecies. We begin to overreact. Others tend to brush everything aside like this is just hysteria. There's just a big mainstream media political agenda. It's probably the wisest thing to, to recognize and have some knowledge of what our biases are and avoid extremes and listen to good counsel. But my encouragement to you is to avoid online extremists, particularly those that manipulate your bias. We know social media is a good thing. So the fact that we can do this and that we can worship together, that's a good thing. So there's great things to, to, to pluck out of there, but we also know that social, social media is not necessarily helping the issue in some other areas. It's kind of ironic to me that in an age of unprecedented access to information, that during a crisis like this, social media does more to spread disinformation and hysteria. So just keep that in mind and, and just know that our disposition as a church at this point is to defer to the CDC and our government, not getting too far ahead of them, not lagging behind. We believe that God puts people in places of authority, and so we're going to follow that. So heed wise counsel. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is move forward in faith, not backwards in fear. If I was honest with you, there have, I've had my moments. I've had my moments of discouragement. I still have my moments of anxiousness if I was really transparent with you. But I was reminded this week that the early church wasn't known. They weren't known for stockpiling ample food and ammunition. Not that they had ammunition there. But ammunition for themselves or spreading fear on social media. Christian witnesses throughout history have been known for hope and faith and self-sacrifice, imitating Jesus Christ who ran toward tragedy, not away from it. So this is a great opportunity to do this in safe ways, as we've been recommended, but a great opportunity for us. Uh, Rodney Stark, an author, tells the story of how the gospel saw unprecedented expansion in a time of the plagues, and especially in the first century. So in AD 165, while Marcus Aurelius was emperor, there was a plague that struck the Roman Empire. And for over a 15-year period, so remember, there their understanding of science and, and, and medicine wasn't, isn't, wasn't what it is today, but that, that plague killed, killed nearly 33% of the population. And at this time, there was a speculated uh, around 45,000 Christians in existence. Remember, this is AD 165, so just about 0.08% uh, of the empire. And despite their numbers, their response to that pandemic won admiration and it won a following. Um, they were a witness. They were a light. Dionysius, um, who was the bishop of Corinth, reported, most of our brother Christians, he writes, showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attended to the every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy. Many in nursing and curing others transferred that death to themselves and died in their steed. So this was a stark difference, if you go on and look, to those who were outside of the church. Dionysius continues, he says, but with non-Christians, everything was quite otherwise. They deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends. They shunned any participation or fellowship with death, which yet, with all of their precautions, it wasn't easy for them to escape. And, and he goes on to point out, and in evident irony, the Christian death rates in many of these plagues were substantially lower nearly two-thirds lower. Some analysts also say that it was because of their strong sense of community, their commitment to care for one another, and their, their robust hope. That's such an important word, their, their hope in the face of death, and their willingness to embrace death and not fear that they found light. Uh, another author, Andy Crouch, explains, if you were a first century Roman, I want you guys to think about this, after you had recovered from that plague, if you did, 
where would you want to worship? The pagan temple whose priests and elite benefactors had fled at the first sign of trouble, or the household or neighbor who had brought you food and, and water and care and concern at great risk to themselves. So as I thought about that, as I read that this week, when this plague is passed, what will our neighbors remember of us? Well, they remember that the Christian church, the, they, they took immediate and decisive action to protect the vulnerable, even at great personal and organizational risk. Will they remember that being prepared and free from panic, the households of their Christian neighbors were able to and ready to give aid and need while protecting them, right, following protocol, but provide for their needs and bring hope? I really think that this is a time when we can be at our best, caring for the elderly, caring for the hourly worker by sharing, caring for those who are unemployed, volunteering child care for medical workers if need be. You see, that, that's the biggest thing in all of this, and it's the third practical thing I want to give to you is that we can proclaim hope. I just want us to, to ruminate on that word hope. I read recently that while this situation is new, our calling hasn't changed. The gospel is still the most important message in the world, and we're still called upon to tell it. It's, it's a gospel of love and faith precisely is what we need in a society that's filled with fear and uncertainty. So I, I just want us to remember, and it's, it's evident if you've, if you've kept your eyes open over the last month, that you have neighbors that are scared. You've got people that are feeling hopeless. They're asking questions about life and death and, and what happens after. Those are questions that are usually hidden way deep down. As believers, we have answers to those questions. And so God is moving. We, we have to be faithful at our post in pointing people to Jesus. And so today is Palm Sunday. It's, it's the Sunday that we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. While all these people are cheering, Jesus was at his post and he was pointed to the cross. And I think about the prophecy given by Zechariah in, in chapter 9, verse 9. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so today, on this Palm Sunday, as we meet dispersed out in our homes, what is Jesus asking of you? What is he inviting you to be a part of, to fulfill some part of his great plan in this broken world? Are you standing at your post? Is it a neighbor who needs groceries or financial help? Is it an elderly shut-in that needs just a call of encouragement or a card in the mail? Is it a family member who's struggling with anxiety that just needs a listening ear? Not your advice, just a listening ear. Is it a healthcare worker who's struggling to keep going and moving forward and courage amidst daily fears and extra hours of work and whatever it is that God's inviting you to be part of, do it in the name of Jesus so that you not only offer help, but you offer hope as well. Whatever he invites you to do as he speaks to you, don't hold back, but release it freely. And I, I truly believe that he's going to do amazing things through what we have to offer. In just a week, we're going to be celebrating the, this holiday that has been at the center of Christianity for 2,000 years, and that's Easter. There have been, if you think about it, there was never a more hopeless time, humanly speaking, than when the Son of God was in the grave. And it was at that point that it seemed like the end. The disciples themselves were despairing. But Easter is a reminder that he's alive. That there's, you know, as, as sure as he walked out of the grave, he promises, remember God's provision and strength and promises, that he promises life to those of us living literally right now in the valley of the shadow of death. You have that to offer to your neighbors. Christ is alive and he's coming again. The final thing that I want to encourage you with today is to use this season to, to develop some good habits. God does some of his greatest work in the mundane places. And so we're, we're in the midst of a, an extended Sabbath, so to speak, where we're still working, but it's just different. A lot of the things that we would normally do, we're not doing. So don't just survive this time. Redeem it. Don't waste it. Draw near to the Lord and to your families. C.S. Lewis lived at a point in the 1960s when a lot of people were genuinely afraid that they were going to be destroyed by nuclear weapons. And he was once asked, you know, how do you continue to live without fear knowing that any minute you could be destroyed? And he said, well, what I know is that all of us will die eventually. 
we, we may not know how or when we're going to die. We may not know when it's going to come. Very likely it'll be unexpected. And, and I know that that sounds a bit morbid, but when we resolve ourselves to that, we can begin to use whatever amount of time we have, whether it's six days, six months, 60 years to embrace life to capitalize on whatever opportunities God's put in front of us. Our main question, and, and here's what I want to give to some of you today, our main question shouldn't be um, when or how we're going to die, but how we live while we're alive. Church, God is up to something. He's on the move, and he's leading us in new ways. So let's go forward with great expectations as we follow him in this season. At this time, I want to invite you to take a moment of quiet as a family where you're at, before the Lord as we prepare to take the emblems of communion together. And so I just want to give you a moment to pray together, to have some quiet time together as a family. Don't take the emblems yet. We'll do that together after we read some scripture, and we'll do that as, as, as a group. In Luke chapter 22, 19 and 20, again, it says, and he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So this morning, friends, brothers, and sisters, this bread represents Jesus' body that was nailed to the cross, placed in the tomb, but is risen for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's take that bread together. And likewise, this cup represents Jesus' blood that was shed to cover us in his righteousness for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life. Would you take that with me now? Let's sing one more song of worship together. Great is thy faith. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changes not, Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever will be. Great is Thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto
thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. you pray with me? Father, I'm asking you to encourage my friends today. Would you cover us all in your protective armor, protecting our minds with the knowledge that we have of the salvation we have through you? You poured out your blood for us. Protect our hearts with that salvation given to us through your son's life, death, and resurrection. Give us courage and faith to battle discouragement and fear. Help us to be a people who shine a spotlight on your one and only son, Jesus. May we be motivated in this new week to share the good news of life in a time that people are so scared to death of death. We want to give you the praise and glory as a God who does not change, and we trust you even though we cannot comprehend you. Thank you for keeping us under your wing. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. South Milford Church of Christ, we love all of you. I pray that you would keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and keep walking in his footsteps. I want to invite you again this week to fast with me beginning Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. We'll close out Wednesday at 6 p.m. And don't forget that this coming week, we're going to be, or this week, we're going to be having a Facebook Live open forum on Wednesday evening following the fast at 7 o'clock. It's just a time to check in with one another, to be encouraged as we share how God is moving in, it, even in, in, in good ways, even in this time, and to share prayer requests that we have with one another. I pray that you all have a blessed day. Thank you so much for joining us.